We've been talking two or three sessions on new beginnings because God has many new beginnings in the scripture but from each one I believe we can learn much not only by way of learning but by way of preparation and I trust we all recognize that it isn't just in the knowledge of it of what God is going to do but in the seeking to walk in it that God might prepare our hearts, it's only in that that the knowledge God gives will be of any value. I use the expression, God wants to translate the knowledge we have into living truth. And I believe that's right. He he tells us things, not, well, there's areas there that I don't know and I'd like to know, but um, he only tells us the part. In fact, a very small part we know in part, and it's, it's not that we lack a little in knowledge, it's we only know a little. Mm-hmm. And uh, he shows us what we need to know, that we might have vision and expectation and hope and press on towards the goal. The goal. And it amazes me that the Apostle Paul having traveled through some of these same countries that we're talking about today, and I'm not just sure if Bulgaria was a part of it or not, but traveled through those countries, lit a fire and went on, because that's God's way. Not that you just have to stay there 50 years to establish a church, but when God is in charge, you light a spark and he could go on, come back, and here was a church that needed to be further established in the things of God. And those things are tremendous, but and we can't help but rejoice in what God's doing in these countries. But after, I never did find out exactly, maybe 20, 25 years of that, he says to the Philippians, I want to know God. That might know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul, didn't you know him? If I just knew God one tenth, the way you know him, I'd settle for it. Wouldn't you? I want to know God. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. And so every time God moves afresh, It's so tremendous, so wonderful, so glorious. It never drops into our heart unless God by his spirit makes it real to us. It's just the beginning. God has much more. God has things that I have not seen nor ear heard, which have not entered into the heart of man. He's prepared for those that love him. And unto us, Paul says, God hath revealed them by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the depths of God. And so, whenever God moves in a new way, right in, right in the victory song of the new thing God is doing, he plants the seed of a new working that God wants to do. Plants the seed of a new working in the very victory song of what he's doing today. There's the seeds of truth that God has implanted for still another working. And we find it all through the scriptures. And so they come out of Egypt, oh, with a mighty hand of God. And we talked a little bit about it. God was bringing them into something. But to bring them in, he had to bring them out. I bring you out to bring you in. Let's never forget that. And as he brought them out, the joy of it, the victory of it. Miriam took a tambourine and led the ladies in dances before the Lord. The horse and his rider be thrown into the sea. One of Moses' songs. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song. Exodus 6. 
15, but right in that beautiful psalm of victory, there are seeds of God's intention of what he's really trying to do. It wasn't all in that. God wanted to do something else. 15, verse 2, I will prepare him a habitation. Oh, yeah, I know, but forget that. God has destroyed Pharaoh and the Red Sea. Right, we got to rejoice in everything God's done. Paul said, writing to the Hebrews, I fear, I fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come short of it. And without going into that in any great detail, just catch what Paul is saying. Let's not fall short of God's intention. God help us that we will not fall short of it. Because they received a message that in God's intention was designed to lead them not just out of Egypt where they were now in singing the victory song, but would lead them in to a prepared place in God. A prepared place. I will prepare him a habitation. Verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. God wants to lead us into his holy habitation where God dwells in us, not just is in us, dwells, lives there. That's his home. God wants to make you people his home, where he shall go no more out, where we shall go no more out. Verse 17, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. God wants to bring us to a place where God's dwelling and dwell in him in that place. In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. And so, if God gives us the right spirit, his desire is that every time we see something new in God, a new place, a new beginning, a new start, that he would open our eyes to see what, what is he saying about what's coming next. Oh, you say, forget that. This is good enough. I'll tell you why it's not good enough. Because God says, I can't rest till I find a habitation. Oh, you say, God doesn't need a habitation. He dwells in the heaven of heavens. God could never find a home in the universe he made. He could never find it. Thus saith the high and lofty one and inhabiteth eternity. I know he does. I dwell also in the high and holy place, but with him who is poor and contrite to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God says, I dwell there. And to Israel he said, where is the place that you build unto me? Where is the place that I might find a rest? Because we get the notion so often that God is finding his rest in something that he's already done something that we're doing, that God is finally delighted in it. God says, building me a house. We talk much about building God's church and God's building his church in the earth and he uses his people to be co-laborers together with him and all that's very wonderful. But we must beware lest we think that we're building a church to present to God Because when we get that attitude, like the Israelites had, we built this temple for you, Lord. Aren't you happy about it? God says, where is the place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? I made it all, he said. You didn't do it. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my word. And so he brings us back to that. 
He dwells with the humble. He dwells, dwells with the contrite. And why? Why God? Because God will not give his glory to another. And contrite means, look it up in Dr. Strong's, bruised, broken, uh, broken so much that he's useless, you know. It's smashed. It's, why does God want to dwell there? Because unless he breaks the vessel that we've been preparing for him, he cannot be glorified until he smashes it and brings forth a new creation for his own glory. For God will not give his glory to another. And we thank the Lord for every mighty working of God, every victory. Of a new day had come. They crossed over. They'd been delivered from Egypt. But even as they do that, they're reminded, God's guiding you to his holy habitation. He's going to bring you in and plant you in the mountain of his inheritance, in the place which he made for us to dwell in, in the place that he made for himself to dwell in. And so the story is, out of Egypt and into Canaan, that's what God wants. Not just out of, but into But it had to be through a wilderness, which he didn't tell them about too much. Because he had to take them through there to prepare them for Canaan. They never did understand. They never did understand why God would have taken them through the wilderness when he promised them to bring them into Canaan. He promised Canaan, he brings them to a wilderness. How devastated we've been at times when we saw the promises of God and embraced them, and the first thing you know, we're in a wilderness. You get a little foretaste of it, even in the wilderness, you get the foretaste of the land. Because God's faithful to give us a little taste of it, so that we know what it's all about. So they bring back the grapes and we taste it. We know it must be good and we hear the report, yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. But somehow we can't learn to so walk with God and to so partake of that heavenly manna that we come to know God's ways. So that to the people of God who came out of Egypt and sang the victory song and danced before the Lord because of the victory he had given to them, he said, these people have not known my ways and I was grieved with them for 40 years. <coughs> and I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my habitation. That's a frightening thing that God, the God who blessed a nation as he's never blessed any nation on the face of the earth with his abiding presence hovering over them by day and by night, feeding them with manna faithfully every day, a food that had every ingredient in heaven that was needed to make them to be healthy and strong and vital, something we don't know today in the church. Blessed them, gave them water out of the rock, the abiding presence of God over their tabernacle. Not once, if it happens once on this continent, it becomes a matter of something we can write about and we remember it for 50 years. It happened up in Canada at a convention they used to have about 60, 70 years ago. The glory cloud would abide over the tabernacle. People coming with their horse and buggy, they say, there it is, there's God's presence abiding over the tabernacle. And it's something that you remember, something that happened once and that happened to Israel for 40 years, day and night. And God says, they have not known my ways and not my heart's been grieved with them. And I swear my wrath, they can't enter into my rest. What, what does God want? He wants a place to live in. And he can't find it in the heavens and he can't find it in the churches. So he's building a church. He's building a habitation for himself. And that's the Canaan. 
But we can't get there till he deals with the old life, and that's what the wilderness is. When God was trying to deal with our old life so they could come into Canaan, they blamed God for it. And God was leading them through the wilderness merely to reveal to them the state of their own heart. And so they had no sooner come out of Egypt and the beautiful song of victory that must have thrilled them to see a million people there or more, maybe three, four million rejoicing over the victory God gave them for their enemies and talk about dancing before the Lord. And a few days later, God led them to Marah and they were thirsty. They had nothing to drink because they'd gone three days without anything to drink. And they saw the pool and they ran to it and looked down and took of it and drank and just bitter they couldn't drink of it. And they called it Mara. Bitter. Bitter waters. That's a victory song. Three days later. Why wouldn't they blame God? I mean, how could you help but blame God when they're famishing and they lead them to bitter waters because they didn't know his ways. They didn't understand that never penetrated their hearts that the God who opened up the Red Sea was able to make every bitter experience to be in his will. They didn't know that that pool of Mara was God saying, this is what you're like. You're born in bitterness. You walk in bitterness. You're filled with it. This is what you're like. Taste it and see what you're like. And the first thing they'd see, because it wasn't a running stream, it was a pool. The first thing they would see is their, their own face. And God was showing them themselves. And they drank of it and it made them embittered. Trying to drink fountains out of the bitterness of their own hearts. Moses was baffled, I guess, but he looked around for God's direction. God showed him a tree up there in the banks. Cut it down, throw it into the waters. And he did, and the waters were sweet. And they drank thereof and were refreshed. I mean, all through the wilderness, and there was 41 different stopping places before they got to this one. We can't go into all that today. All through, God was revealing to them the inherent bitterness, sin, corruption of their own life. What for? That in this wilderness which we are, God might plant his garden. That the wilderness in the solitary place would blossom as the rose, that we are that wilderness. And they didn't understand that. We are the wilderness, because it's here that God wants to live. It's here that God wants to build his sanctuary. This is the place that you have ordained, O Lord, as a place for thee to dwell in. This is the only place. He couldn't find anything else, because he didn't make anything else that was compatible with him. He made a man in his image. He made a man to be his image in the earth. What about other planets? I don't know. But the totality of God's eternal purposes are to be found in the man that he made in his image. No other place, and I know it's in this human family. I know that because as Jesus came into this human family, not taking on him the name of or the likeness of angels or other celestial hosts. If there are, you know, who knows? But our Lord Jesus came into this humanity. He became an Adam. That in this last Adam, God might restore that image that he might finally have found for himself this habitation that he never did find in any degree of fullness before, even though in Adam, the first Adam, he had a foretaste of it. God never gives, gives up on his vision, his dream. 
his plan, his purpose. You and I can. You can call it far out things if you like. I know it's far out. Things that I haven't dreamt of, I haven't thought of, I haven't heard of. Paul says God's prepared for those that love him. And so he led them on. But he showed them the tree at manna that made the bitter waters sweet. And so, what's your complaint? What's your bitterness? What's the thing that's bothered you? I sense that with most of you at least, I'm sure that God has made every bitter thing sweet. If he hasn't, find the tree. It's always there in the banks of manna. It's always there. It's the cross, I know, but you have to find that application of the cross in your life for any bitterness that you discover in your own heart. Now, we just touched on the one, but God is leading them on, on and on, to another beginning. I wish we could realize that this is a journey. Instead of, there's, no, there's nothing new. I'm saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues and prophesy is nothing new. And settle down, it's a journey. And the New Testament church, before they, well, men coin phrases to describe something that God does. And when the New Testament church got walking with God, it was called the way. This way. They didn't know anything about the way. I used to wonder about that until I realized it is a way. We're on a journey. We're not to be stagnant. We're not to settle down. Thank him for every good thing he does, every blessing he gives, every victory he gives us, but it's a way. And all along the way, there are new experiences that pose trials, perplexities, problems. So they arise from Mara having had their thirst quenched with fresh water. And God says, is this to say, don't you know what I'm teaching you? If you will walk in my ways and obey my statutes, serve me, I will lay upon you none of the diseases that I've laid upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. God is saying that having rooted out all the bitterness of the old life, and as we begin to walk in covenant union and relationship with him, he is going to fulfill the promise that his church will walk in physical as well as in spiritual health. Amen. After I wrote the Feast of Tabernacles, I went through a wilderness of my own. Because God was revealing those things, even while the rest... By and large, the majority of Latter-day churches were caught up with the gifts of the Spirit and healings and prophecies and mighty movings of God. And there were, there were missionary outreaches and going to nations, and it, it, it became a worldwide movement. But even at the beginning, God said, the reason I'm restoring my gifts of the Spirit to the church is that I might prepare that church that I will make of them one body to prepare me for my appearing. God never lost that vision, though the majority of the people in what became known as latter rain did. It's God's moving, it's rain, it's rain, it's raining, it's raining. And the healing evangelists, they didn't come out of that movement, but God raised up great healing evangelists. At that same time, just seemed to, God was pouring out his spirit all over this continent, in one way or another, with eight, ten, twelve great healing evangelists with their big tents, filling them with people, not only to be healed, but to see the mighty works of God uh, that he was doing in others, and went on maybe ten years, and then they all folded up. We wonder why. It's because God cannot let his people rest, nor will he rest till he finds the desire of his heart. And that's a people walking in total harmony and union with him where we dwell in God and God dwells in us. That's his desire. He won't forsake it. And if we forsake the vision, God just leaves us, that's all. 
having done great things and giving us the victory over Pharaoh and sweetening the waters at Marah and all that, God must have a prepared people to go into this prepared place. And so after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise. Oh, they lamented over the death of Moses. We always lament over the end of a past era. But we shouldn't if we know God's ways. Because when God does a mighty thing through his people in the very thing that he's doing, he sows the seeds of what he would do next. And God intends that that will be our vision then. Oh, how people lamented when latter rain petered out. I don't think it lasted too long. In my own experience, I thought that maybe two or three years, the impact of it bothered me, troubled me. Not only that, but God was closing down the healing ministries. It flourished there for eight, ten years. And it seemed to be petering out as well. I'd even take a book off my shelf sometimes and read it to get a little encouragement. The book called The Feast of Tabernacles. But I mean, I thought, why did I write that anyway? And I remember two or three times taking it down and reading it. Why did I write that? Nobody wants to read that. It lay around for... 2,000 copies that were printed originally, I think, took about 10 years. But uh, it's been encouraging. Uh, these days, to run across people who read it then when I was in a wilderness and got help from it, got out of their wilderness. <laughs> so I am assured that the vision is right. God hasn't first forsaken his vision. He won't settle for something less just because you and I are quick to do it. He will not rest till he establishes, till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth, until the salvation goes forth as the shining, brilliant light. That's what God said. And because he said that, he shares the burden of his heart with his people. And in Isaiah 62, he calls them watchmen that he set on the walls. And watchmen have various duties. One was to warn the enemy, warn the people of God of the approaching enemy. I know that. But another purpose of the watchman is to cry unto God day and night and to give God no rest till he establishes and until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Because that's God's vision. And therefore he puts that vision on the hearts of his people, his watchmen, not everybody. But those whom he calls watchmen on the walls, I have set watchmen upon thy walls of Jerusalem, who shall not hold their peace day or night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. God declared that was his vision in verse 1 and 2. He says, this is my vision. I can't rest till it happens, so he needs helpers. We call them intercessors, or people who come into union with God. Because we come into the yoke of Christ, we carry the same burden that he carries. He carries the main load, I know, but if we're in his yoke, we'll feel the burden of his heart. And remember that you can only carry a burden that's of the Lord as you get in his yoke. Others will try to lay yokes upon you because they feel that's their yoke. If it is, that's good. But God has a burden for you as you come into his harness. And it'll be the burden of God's heart for you very individually. And so you don't shrug that off because you likes what somebody else is doing. 
it looks more appealing, it looks more wonderful, there seems to be more success in it, you have to bear the yoke that God has laid upon you, whether it be a sower of the seed, a plowman, and a sower, or one who waters it, or one who goes and reaps the harvest, reaps the harvest. You want to be one who reaps the harvest. I always did. I never wanted to sow seeds. I wanted to be an evangelist. But it's not of my choosing. Why did I want to be an evangelist? Because I brought it in Pentecost, and the only man that was really doing anything effectual for God was the evangelist. Teachers, you'd hear them say, I remember once I, they didn't know I was listening, but yeah, I think, I think George would be a teacher. I don't think he'd be an evangelist. <laughs> Oh, you know, you irk under that. <laughs> teacher, because in those days, I never sat under a, a vital teacher of the gospel. You know, and go through studies and dry, and I don't want to be that, Lord. I want to I want to see signs and wonders and miracles, and I want to see souls come in. And I still want to see that, but I'm a member of a body, and it's happening. It's happening in the body of Christ in measure but let's not settle for it yet when can we settle we can't settle for it until God settles and God says this is what I've been looking for this has been the dream of my heart a holy bride without spot or blemish or any such thing it will be presented unto the Lord Jesus Christ and it's going to she's going to come to that place and I always want to remind people because they always got this crazy notion that we just live in sin and perfection, that sin and imperfection down here, and then we're, we're translated suddenly, we're the beautiful bride of Christ. It's by the washing of the water, by the word, that he's going to prepare this holy bride. Moses, my servant, is dead. Don't look back now. Moses was faithful. That's good. And we're glad he was faithful. Because he was faithful, Joshua learned the ways of the Lord as he walked with Moses. But he says, now Moses is dead. Go into the land now. Take it. God had prepared it. He called it his land. He says, his eyes are upon it day and night. How be it? There are in that land abominable nations that God says you've got to subdue. Seven abominable nations. God says, it's your land. And it's a prepared place. So you don't have to go in and build the houses. You don't have to go in and plant the vineyards. You don't have to go in there and irrigate the land with your foot like they used to do in Egypt. <coughs> they had a sort of a crude irrigation system and a pump that they'd made that they had to pump away there with their foot. Get a little trickle of water out of the Nile because God was going to have streams flowing in that place. But, you know, we like the old pump better, don't we? pump away, try and get a little trickle of water. Thank God for the little trickle of water, but pumping away until you're weary. God says the rivers are flowing, the houses are built, the fruit trees are yielding fruit. It's all prepared. You just have to go in and confront these enemies. And God will put the fear of God upon them so that they'll yield readily. They'll be terrified at your presence. The thing that ran through my mind this morning as I heard these tremendous testimonies of God's mighty working in Bulgaria is that God used the communist system for 40 years to prepare this land. It's a prepared place. And then the fearful thought came to me, God, how long must we know hardship and devastation and trouble in this land before we'll be a prepared people? Forty years? I don't think so. Because I know God can do a quick work in the land. Your country or mine are not ready to receive the three or four brethren that went to Bulgaria and to see the same things happening amongst them as happened there. They were prepared 
through persecution. And while the church sends delegations to Washington or to Ottawa, do something about human rights in these countries, because the church is persecuted, do something about it over there. And I was told this for a fact, they're praying, God, do something about America by way of persecution and hardship that they might come to know you. I've only been on the, off the continent once and went to Kenya. One man told me that God was going to send him to America. I think he was itching to come. I tried to discourage him on it, to know for sure God's timing. But he said God showed him that he was going to send that uh, lights from Africa to dark America. When we used to talk about sending a light from America to dark Africa. And that's, that's his vision. He's anxious to get over here, but I don't think he was really ready, and I don't think America's ready yet. But you're going to see it, I believe. Missionaries come to this one. You say, we don't need it. We got all kinds of Bibles, and we know that. I know you know. You have all that. But you're not a prepared people yet. And these people don't have the Bibles and the understanding and the knowledge, but it's a prepared land. Prepared by persecution. Prepared by an evil system. You say, how can that be? The land that was flowing with milk and honey, cultivated, gardens planted, houses built, was done by people who hated God. The seven abominable nations of Canaan. They don't get any credit for that. Because of their wicked and abominable deeds, God wiped them out. Nevertheless, he used them in the meantime. God always uses the devil, you know, to fulfill his purposes at times. And God never gives the devil credit for it. Because the devil is out to subdue and to destroy and to defeat and to conquer. We know that. But God, and it's all in the cross. It's all in the teaching of the cross. God revealed to us the glory of your cross. That here is a man defeated in the natural, in the appearance, devastated, persecuted, harassed, slain by the enemy, by Satan. Not Satan, not knowing that what he was doing out of the blindness and darkness of his soul, God was working it into his purpose that he might be our Redeemer. And that in his crucifixion, he was literally, though being crucified by the wise of this world who didn't know God, in God's purposes, he was destroying these principalities and powers, making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. I read an article not long ago that Jesus was defeated on the cross, that that was defeat, it was his resurrection that was victory. I hope that he was just using terminology that wasn't quite correct. It, it appeared to be defeat. But the cross, and not the resurrection, it was the cross where he destroyed Satan. Because just as we... Well, I'm going to say digress a little again, but it wasn't a case of Jesus saying, I must go to a cross and so, Father, you'll have to arrange somehow that people will crucify me because I must die for my people. He was a light shining into the world. He was God revealed in the flesh. He was truth. He was a very expression of the heart of God. Nothing that was in God was lacking in Jesus. And yet, he came as a man that 
It wouldn't be something, that deity wouldn't be something in the realm of which he would walk. He would be secluded in his humanity, and he would live as a man in total dependence on the Father, doing nothing because I'm God in the flesh, but because I'm a man in whom the Father can live and move and direct and to whom I must be totally obedient. So that he did what he did on earth as a man, and that's tremendous. Because I know in my early days, it always seemed to me he was half God, half man. And so when he needed to be God, he stepped into his deity and walked in the water or turned water into wine or said, peace be still, because he was half God and half man, till I realized he was totally man, as well as totally God. But his deity poured into humanity, making him weak. God taking on flesh, making him weak, humbled, emptied, it says in the original, emptied himself, becoming weak, becoming poor, that in that state of humanity, weak humanity, but perfect, without sin, in that humble state, God could show forth his glory and his power. That he would be a servant. He would be a doula. When I saw that, then I realized he is my example. He is my example. But you say, yeah, but he has sin. We have, he had no sin. We have sin. And that's why he comes to bring us redemption. He who had no sin became our perfect sin offering. He had to be without sin, just as that lamb had to be without blemish that he could be our sin offering, that we could come away from that embracing of the cross with our sins dealt with, so that now he's bringing us up to his level as a, an Adam free from sin. So now we're on his level. If you understand what I mean, as far as nature is concerned, he's always our Lord and Master. But because he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham, and was in all points made like unto man, and tempted in all points, sin accepted. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren, saying, Behold, I am the children whom thou hast given me. I just emphasize that, because now he's our example because he dealt with our sin and he's our example and so Paul was able to say let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God something he should strive after but emptied himself and was made in the form of man and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself still further to become incarnate was a great step of humiliation for Almighty God just to take upon himself human flesh because that made him weak. It made him finite. It made him, brought him into the realm of, of need. He hungered. He thirsted. He grew weary. He got tired. That was humility just to become a man. But he didn't become a king or a prince. He became a doulos, a bond slave. He took the lowest place in the by reason of the fact he became a man and laid aside that glory and became a doulos and faithfully in the realm of humanity as a slave, as a bond slave, he kept, he did the will of God. It became his total delight and God was well pleased and exalted him to the highest throne in the universe. And Paul says, have that same mind that was in Christ that caused him to go that route. Humble ourselves. Take this place of a servant, one who serves another. Take that place. And that will determine the measure of glory that he has for us. That will determine it. Not necessarily the apostles, or the prophets, or the teachers, or the evangelists. Not necessarily them. But that humble, Man, woman, child of God, who has become a true doulos, 
to the Lord Jesus and we're going to be amazed in the day of Christ when we stand before him and to see the weak and the poor and the impoverished not only in the natural but in spirit people whose names we know nothing about even in church history stand there rewarded with the highest reward that God could give and becoming a habitation of God the place the one that God wanted the ones that he desired many apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers elders deacons healers workers of miracles we'll be looking around to see where they are and what kind of honor they're receiving. I believe that's true. So sometimes, you know, it bothers me when sometimes women whom God has placed in subjection to man to become irksome over it. Don't you, man or woman, long to be in subjection to the Lord Jesus? And so a godly woman who is married she loves that relationship. She loves to be under the headship of her husband. Just as we love to be under the headship of Christ. And some of them feel, you can't deprive me of ministry. I can be a ministry just as much as a man and quote scripture for it. Well, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying, just becoming a great minister doesn't mean that you're in a superior position. To become a bond slave is the highest position for man or woman. That's the highest. That's the highest thing you can do. I mean voluntarily, because we're born to be sons and children of God. We're not born to be slaves. But being a son and having privileges and rights, it's a high order to say, yeah, I know I'm the king's son. And so they're teaching, you're God's kids, live it up. God's kings in the spiritual realm desire to be God's slaves <coughs> because God's kings though they know they are that because the word says so made us to be a kingdom of priests they love their master so much that they say just, just let me be a servant in your house forever and with his ear pierced with the awl, that's the sign. I just want to hear his voice and none other. I just want to do what he says. I don't want to be free anymore. In the sense, you know, that I can do as I will. I don't want that kind of freedom anymore. Because if you have that attitude, the time comes when you realize I'm free to do as I want, to go as I want, go and come, go preach or go get a job. I can do what I want. I'm free. When you come as bondservant, you find you're not. You must learn to do what he wants. Which might be preaching, but don't think that's the highest order in God. The highest order in God is to walk with God. You know, for one time, you no, know, 40 years ago, I guess, I was getting concerned about my ministry because I was getting up around 30 or so. So you can, <laughs> if you're good in arithmetic, you know, you can. i got to tell you this. I hope what Steve doesn't mind. <laughs> One day he says, how long have you known the Lord? I says, oh, let me see, 56 years. A day or two later, we're sitting at the table. He says, when did you come to know the Lord? How old were you? <laughs> so I know what you I says, what was it? I said, Whatever it was, 19 years. Anyway, it comes to 74 in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd uh, Lord, you know, I know you want, you've called me to ministry. I knew that from maybe I was five or six years old. But here I'm 30, 32, and, and what do you want me to do, Lord? And so I, I opened up the scripture. And you know, I don't do that very often, but I, I was just sort of fumbling through and, and I hit upon that scripture in, um, Micah. 
What, O oh man, does the Lord require of you but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? Well, fine, I just accidentally come across that and, yeah, that's a good scripture. And, uh, <laughs> but I, that wasn't really what I was wanting to know. I wanted to know about my ministry, Lord. And so that might have been the end of it, but I'd be opening up there every day for three or four days. <laughs> sort of felt God must be talking to me. But I never heard what he said. Never really heard what he said until one day, maybe 30 years later, I suddenly realized there's no higher calling for you or I in this life or in eternity but to walk with God. It took me all those years to learn that. All he wants. And you might be an apostle and not walk with God. You might be a prophet and not really walk with God. You might be a teacher and still not walk with God. But you can be a farmer and walk with God. You can be a carpenter and walk with God. You can be a tinsmith and walk with God. And God wants people who walk with Him. And his lament with the children of Israel whom he had redeemed with such a mighty hand was that they don't know my ways, they haven't followed me. They never discovered my ways and I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. What's he saying? I won't be able to find my home in them. God needs rest? Yes, God needs rest. He needs a home. God need a home? Yes. Because by nature, he's loving, gentle, kind, compassionate. By nature, he's a father. Christ had to come because God is father. That's why every fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named after the father. Because he is inherently what he is, he must have a family compatible with his own heart like him a people in his image it's just not an arbitrary thing he, he must have that because he's father so Paul said I, I find it in my heart to pray to the father that you might be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. And see what he's saying. God's desire. As we read it, as we quote it, it increases with its intensity. It's not one thing maybe, but it's step by step by step until we come to the fullness of what he's saying. Strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to apprehend with all saints. I caught that once when I wanted to apprehend this that I'm talking about and God says it's with all saints. And so I came to realize I would not enter into it apart from the church. I couldn't go into it on my own much as I would have liked to because I'm an isolationist. I'm a loner. I like to get away from people. <laughs> but God says it's with all saints. And if you enjoy some of what I'm saying these days, and some have told you that you did, you have to know it's only because God has confined me and made me to know I won't go any farther in God except as I bring the people of God further. Mm. And I don't say by that that I'm ministering for a selfish motive. <laughs> it's just the way God has ordained it because that you might be able to apprehend with all saints what is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. I'd shout it, but I ruin my voice if I get too excited. 
<laughs> and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled unto all the fullness of God. <laughs> of God that's what Jesus was when he was here but he went away that he might distribute his gifts his blessings his nature upon his church that with all saints we might be filled into the same fullness that was in Jesus And so he told them how they were to go into Canaan. The priests will take it in. The priests will open up the way. The priests will carry the ark of God. And when you see the priests of the Lord going before you, carrying the ark of God, you go after it. Go after it, the ark. They're to carry the ark, but you're to go after, not the priests, but the ark. There's too many people going after the priests. They have a high and holy calling, and that is to bring the presence of God on ahead of the people that the people might go after God they might follow after the Lord and while when they touched the waters God said the waters would divide it's a new way another new beginning they'd already crossed the Red Sea the new beginning they sang the victory song God said I'm bringing into Canaan but to go into Canaan they had to come through the wilderness to be stripped to be weakened to know the frailty of their own flesh to know what was in them God had to root that out that God might have a prepared place for a prepared people the priests go ahead God's kings are really priests. The king of all kings and lord of all lords. To him it was said, Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever. We get caught up in the word kings. Failing to realize it's God's priests that God wants to anoint with kingly authority. God's priests. And that were to reign as kings, all right, but only in virtue of the anointing oil. In virtue of the priesthood. And besides the priests, when they went down into the bottom of the Jordan, with a wall of water on each side, no doubt remembering what happened to their, what was it? cousin or second cousin or something Nadab and Abihu when they did something that seemed to be insignificant but it wasn't a light thing in the sight of God when then they went into the holiest of all and offered up fire which the Lord hadn't ordained God slew them on the spot 
Now here they are at the bottom of a river and the water on each side. Don't you think there was a fear of God in them? And a discipline on the people of God that they could march right on by without standing to admire their beautiful priestly garments. What a wonderful man of God he was. That they marched right on by and went into Canaan. Stopping for a while at Gilgal which I would hope to deal with a little this morning. Stopping at Gilgal and only when they had got over and across the river could the priests come up behind take their place with them. Paul says, I think God has set us, the apostles, back at the end of the line, last of all, as men doomed to death. Because Paul says, always bearing in a about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your mortal flesh he knew the dying of the Lord Jesus just because you're sick or afflicted or dying or die he's not talking about that he's talking about the dying of the Lord Jesus which is the death that Jesus suffered because he walked in obedience to the Heavenly Father. And then at Gilgal, just before the conquest of Jericho, God says, go and circumcise the whole army. Not on the other side of the Jordan, where they have a little bit of security during the time of their infirmity, right there under the noses of the enemy God crippled the whole army one day crippled them totally exposed to their enemies and what did God do to look after that the fear of God came upon the inhabitants of Jericho and they locked the gates and barred them because here was a crippled army brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand wonderful what God's doing especially in other countries we see nothing yet but God have mercy on us here and when I say here I refer to our country I know there's a, a line across there but we're one people who've known so much of God had so many opportunities so much teaching, so much knowledge, but not yet a prepared place. That God will prepare us. That we will have the commitment. God, we don't care what it takes. We want to be a prepared people that we might come a place where you can find your habitation. God bless this word. Dear hearts. What we've been dealing with in the uh, morning session and perhaps uh, Lord willing in a way uh, however he might please uh, carry on through most of next week so um, I'll just read a portion from Joshua chapter 3 We've been talking about new beginnings. We started with the Passover. It is a new day, a new beginning. This day shall be unto you the beginning of months. Emphasizing how God has new beginnings. Over and over there are new beginnings. And that the order is darkness and light. Not light and darkness. Darkness and light. The evening and the morning were the first day. And that, just that one principle ought to fill God's people with great hope. If it's dark, God commands light out of darkness. That's where the light comes from. God commands the light to shine out of darkness. Israel had been in darkness 400 years. God commanded and light shone and God sent a deliverer. And they brought them out. They crossed the Red Sea. A new day for them. But before they could come into the 
purpose for which they came out, God must prove them, try them, test them, which he did through the wilderness. The first generation fails. God's testings. Blame God for their troubles instead of recognizing the evil of their unbelieving hearts. Nevertheless, God was faithful to forgive them. He brought them up to Kadesh, told them now, now is the time to go in. They sent out spies, brought back the report of what they found in the land, admitting it was good, but we couldn't take it. Too difficult for us. And they made an excuse. We couldn't take our children into such a, a dangerous <coughs> land. And God took their excuse and made it to be judgment for them. And he says, I'm going to bring your children in. You're afraid that they can't come in? I'm going to bring them in. And you're going to stay here in the wilderness and die here. And God decreed that the, each day that they spent spying out the land would represent a year in the wilderness. So that for 40 years they were in the wilderness until the old generation was consumed. And so darkness settled on in upon them. But God shines out of darkness. And when the days of his judgment had been finished, God was bringing the new generation to a new day. Joshua, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. So that which was the end of an old day for the generation that failed God was the beginning of a new day for the new generation. And that which was judgment for the old day on the old generation was preparation for a new generation. And out of the darkness that was coming over the old generation, God was beginning to shine forth in a new day to a new generation. The sun was setting for the old generation as the dawn was arising for a new generation. So that's, it's wonderful when we recognize that. But the sad part is that that for which we hope and long for and desire when we come to that point where God says, now is the time, the difficulty seem to be so severe, the trial so severe, that if our hearts are not prepared, when we come to the very day and hour when God wants to bring his people into a new way, and the test comes, that's where so many fail, God. Hoping all along, God sent revival, we're seeking revival, we're praying for revival, God, we must have revival. And the time comes when God says, now this is the time. And we fail. Why not? Because we want revival, don't we? But we fail to understand that with every new day, we call it revival and all we think of is rain and blessing. But God doesn't just look on it that way. It might be a revival of a new day which brings sunshine and heat. And that's what bothered me when what they called rain in the beginning of the, in the middle of this century, what was rain, it didn't last so long. It just lasted a short time until, and it is devastating to many people to see how quickly that which we felt was a revival of the end time, the last revival, uh, it petered out. And, and then came the heat and the sunshine, the heat and barrenness. We don't understand those things because we don't understand God's desire in sending the rain is to water the plantings of the Lord that they might bring forth fruit. And somehow we're slow to comprehend that. Why should God want to send the barrenness and the drought and the heat? Because God's after fruit. That's what he's after. And so when he's blessing and there's a revival, we think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? All ready for the Lord to take us. But he wants the fruit. And like we said this morning, the seeds of what God will do and what God has in mind, the seeds of God's intention is right there in that movement of God, that new thing that God is doing. Right there in that new thing he's doing, 
He plants the seeds of his intention for the next thing he will do. And in early Pentecost, there were many who had a vision of a great harvest after the image of Jesus. Sister Amy Semple McPherson, founder of the Four Square Church, had a great vision of the end time that God, and I don't remember it all, because uh, sometimes since I read it, and I don't think you'll find it in any of her books today, because I'm told that this part isn't there. She says God's looking for fruit, perfect fruit. He's coming for the perfect fruit. That's what he's after. And he is. He's still after it. That's why he's waiting. The husband's waiting for something. He's waiting for perfect fruit. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it till it receive the early and the latter rain. He's still waiting. We know the time is nigh at hand. He's still waiting. So I know that the fruit is going to be perfect fruit. It's going to be better than any fruit he's found yet because he's still waiting. So you see, right in the seeds of the Pentecostal revival, God was imparting truth to prepare them for the next move of God. You say, well, there's no time for any more movements of God. Well, God's judge, not you and I. And they thought that in early Pentecost because the burden of the Spirit was the Lord is coming soon. That was the burden of early Pentecost. And that lingered on 30, 40 years. So people got weary of it and figured the Lord's delaying his coming, not realizing that the Lord comes in many different ways. That he comes in the rain. He comes in his refining fire. And I'm not saying there's two, three, four, five... Six different comings of the Lord. There's one coming, but in that one coming, there's the rising of the sun. In the dawn of the day, he comes to us as the dawning of a new day. And I know there are sudden aspects of it, and I know that the Bible speaks of that sudden translation of the saints, and we believe in that. But there's the shining forth of his presence before that. And so... We are very near to the coming of the Lord and God's going to do a quick work in the earth. He's not going to come just because somebody figures out in the scriptures that he's got to come on a certain day. You think people would learn, you know, you've all heard of that book. There's another one out. Of course, it's not 1988 this time, it's 1996. Well, it might be right. I'm not, surely someone will hit it right. (laughs) But the point is, you and I don't pay any attention to those calculations. All we got to say is, Lord Jesus, you're, you're coming for a people. You're coming for a people who are expecting you. You're coming to receive the precious fruit of the earth. You're coming to receive a glorious bride. So we know then, if we're part of that company, we know we will not be caught unawares. You see, he comes as a thief in the night. I know not to those who are watching. For ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So to those who are walking with him and walking in the light, they don't have to bother with all these books because they know the times. They know the times that the Lord spoke of. And Paul says, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. The thief in the night is the way he will come to those who are not anticipating him. But to them that look for him, he shall appear. The second time without sin and the salvation. And we look for that. And we must continue to anticipate his appearing. But don't look for the second coming. Look for the Lord Jesus. I mean, the second coming is sort of a doctrine that's in the church and people are looking for the second coming. Instead of looking for him. Let's look for him. Anyway, they had come to this new day because... The older generation didn't hear God's voice when God spoke. For them, there was no tomorrow. But for the younger generation in their midst, there was a tomorrow. And as we hear God's voice today and obey him today and hear what he says today and seek to walk with him today, then there's a tomorrow for us. And 
I like to anticipate God's tomorrows. But the only way we're going to really appreciate and uh, and uh, partake of the blessings of God's tomorrows is when we are obedient to hear what he says today. And so the new generation had a tomorrow to look forward to. The older generation didn't. And so, Joshua chapter 3. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it, after the ark, not after the priests. Like they do so often, they go after the man of God. Bring him to ruin, and they themselves are brought to ruin. Because God wants his people to go after him. And furthermore, I want to say, God wants a priestly ministry that will be so dedicated, so committed to God, that they'll bring into the midst of God's people such a fear of God that the people will long to go after God rather than after that vessel. And I don't know, we don't know who's really to blame, but somehow or other, it seems when God brings forth a great and mighty ministry, the people go after him rather than after the God whom he's supposed to be presenting. I think we have to blame both. The people for their lack of vision and discernment and understanding of what God wants, but the ministry for not emphasizing these truths. That God is a jealous God. And not only emphasizing it, but recognizing that as those who stand before the people with a word from God, they are under obligation to so seek God that they will have words from God's mouth by the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit can glorify the Lord Jesus. And if a man is speaking out from his own heart, we're told, Jesus said, he's seeking his own glory. He that speaketh of himself, out from himself, is what it means. He that speaketh out from himself is seeking his own glory. So therefore, what a tremendous responsibility is laid upon God's servants, all of us, that if we, if by the Spirit we're uh, prompted to give forth a word, it must be out from the Holy Spirit. For he it is who takes the things of Christ and makes them known unto us, he shall glorify me, for he shall not speak out from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Speak what he hears. And we always recognize that. But somehow a few years ago, I came to suddenly realize that he inhabits this temple. And that when he speaks, he speaks out of your lips and mine. And I realize we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fulfill the ministry that God gave him to fulfill. That he would not speak out from himself and he dwells within but that which he shall hear, that shall he speak. So it's his responsibility, but it's your responsibility and mine to be that temple of the Holy Spirit, to be in such union with him, to seek him somehow with the best we know that God, when we speak, let us speak words out of your heart. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is not able to fulfill the function that God ordained him to fulfill when he came to abide in this temple. So what does he do? He withdraws. When he is grieved, he withdraws. And the holy presence of God withdraws and we carry on without him, not knowing the difference. So many times, God, where God moved mightily in a person's life or in an assembly, you go back there five, ten years later, and you don't sense any presence of God, but the people don't seem to know the difference or they don't care because he's been driven out. You say, we want the Holy Spirit. I know God's people want the Holy Spirit for that great benefit he brings, 
for his gifts, for his blessings. But how many really want the Holy Spirit to come in and to be Lord in our gatherings together in his name? And we must come to that. In all of these things that we're saying, we're not ministering any condemnation to those who know that we lack in these areas. But that God might inspire our hearts to recognize that we lack. Because if we recognize that we fall short, then God is pleased. Because he will lead us. The sad thing is that when we don't recognize it, we feel we're doing all right. That's the Laodicean spirit. Where we say that we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and don't know. Thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Don't know it. God has everything we need. God has tremendous things for the Laodicean church. As much for this church as any other of the churches. But because they don't know it, won't accept the fact that they're in this need. They're not open for it. How can God give it? I counsel thee. And I, I don't know, I just stop here because there's, the, the Laodicean church is getting so crammed full of counselors. I mean, it's another ministry now. You've got to hire a counselor, maybe two counselors, to deal with the problems. And they get a lot of their, their counsel from books of psychologists that don't even know the Lord. Or you say, no, I get it from Christian books. You check in some of those Christian books. And you'll find that that author got a lot of it from, from psychologists that don't even know the Lord. And so, filling the church with counselors when God says, I counsel you. Buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you might be rich, white raiment, that you might clothe yourself. I serve to anoint your eyes, that you might see. Good counsel. God help us to accept his counsel instead of running to all the other counselors, which in most cases can't help. And I'm not denying that there is a place for counsel in the church. But like my brother back there, Brother Mount, the Lord said he would have a ministry of counseling. And so he thought, well, I'll get these books in counseling. The prophet comes along just before he had time to buy the books, and he says, thou shalt counsel my people, but you won't get it out of books. <laughs> <laughs> counseling with the counsel of God. He's the counselor. And he's got it. He's, he's got good counsel. All we have to do is yield his spirit. And he knows what you need. There's some counselor. Let's see now. What about your father? What about your mother? What about your grandfather? Did they have these problems that you got? Yeah, oh, that's your problem, you know. Goodness, I know it's your problem. But go right back to Adam. We know it started there. God crucified us at the cross. And we, God wants us to partake of the benefits of the cross, not only for our justification, but for deliverance from the old life. And that's what this second crossing was all about. They were delivered by the redemptive lamb, but now there has to be a deliverance from themselves. And so he said, tomorrow the Lord, will, they had a tomorrow. Because they were the younger generation that missed out on that other day. But because of God's oath, God said, I'm going to bring the younger generation in. I swear, he said, I'll, I'll bring them in. And he did. But God said something else when the old generation failed that I think is very significant. Moses, a true priest of the Lord, interceded for the people. And God says, I'll have to destroy them, Moses. And Moses, as a true priest, interceded. He said, Lord, how can you do that? Don't you know what will happen when the Egyptians hear that you destroyed your people, that you brought out of Egypt? What kind of a name are you going to get? And they, they will say, oh, Israel's God... Yeah, he brought them out, but he couldn't look after them in the wilderness, so he destroyed them. And Moses said, God said to Moses, 
All right, I will pardon according to thy word. But because God was more than gracious to that generation whom he was pardoning, more than gracious, there was something in his heart that caused him to say, I'm going to pardon them, but as I live, saith the Lord, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. Is this to say, if you failed and, and, and I'm going to forgive you, I'm a just God, if I'm going to forgive you and keep this nation alive and do great things through them, I swear, he said, by myself, I'm going to fill the whole earth with my glory. So here we are today, and all over the world, the nations, the Gentiles, you say, I think I'm an Israelite. The tribe of Abraham. Well, I won't go into that. <laughs> Except to say, those that are in Christ are Abraham's seed. And those who knew that they were of the lineage of Abraham, Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. So we won't go any further than that. All over the world there are Gentile nations that are receiving and partaking of the gospel of Christ. And, it, and you can look back and see the reason for it. The people whom he chosen to be his own special people failed God and God says, my purposes will not fail. I'm going to fill the whole earth with my glory. Reminding us that human failure never does abrogate God's promises. Those to whom the word comes, and if they fail, it doesn't change God's promise. And Israel got into that trap that we're God's people. To us has been given the glory of God and the covenants and the law, the service of God and the promises. It's been given to us. We can't fail. So God had to send a, a prophet, John the Baptist, to prepare their hearts. Because they were just sitting there like the church is today. We're God's people. Don't get excited. He's coming, I know, but we'll go. And we'll go with him. Instead of realizing that it's an awesome thing to stand in the presence of the mighty God who is coming. He's coming to his church. And somehow, it's, it's never thought to be an awesome thing. Yes, we have the best of God's good gifts down here and then someday he'll come and take us up there where it's even better. Instead of realizing that he comes to purge and cleanse his temple, to purge out all the evil, all the dross, he says to the church at Pergamos, I'm going to come with the sword of my mouth. You see, it's not really the coming of the Lord. When he comes into the church with a sword, a sharp sword to deal with the iniquity in the church, you won't say then it's not really Jesus. He comes. He comes to his church. I know he comes in clouds and translates it, but he comes to his church. He comes in refiner's fire. He comes to purge out the doctrines of Balaam. He comes to cleanse unto himself a holy people. How many coming? One coming, but... He comes in all these different aspects. And so they came to an, a new day and to a new crossing, as it were another baptism, just as they were figuratively baptized in the Red Sea. No, it's so now, as it were another baptism through the Jordan. Not really another, but uh, another aspect of the real baptism. Paul says there's one baptism. You say, what is it? Baptism in the Holy Spirit? Baptism of water? Baptism in death that Jesus spoke about? I have a baptism to be baptized with? Three baptisms? One baptism because each one is just a, a different aspect of that one baptism. And so people get all mixed up in this matter of water baptism. Some say if you're not baptized in water, you're not really saved. And others say, well, it's not really, it doesn't really have any real significance. It's, it's just a figure. But it's one baptism. And I simply illustrate it this way. 
you go to get married, you stand before the preacher and he performs the ceremony, will you, will you take this one, and will you take this one, and I do, and so, well, you're married then, aren't you? Well, yes, you're married, but uh, then he takes you into the room and you sign, you sign for it, you put your signature down. Preacher came to me with that paper. I said, "Listen, I it's fine print there. I want to go home and read that." He, he says, "You sign right there," and I did. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't that I was married twice that day. And so then we lived together. Let's see, happily ever since. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the real marriage. But there wasn't three marriages. And so baptism speaks of that union with Jesus. The real baptism is when you begin to walk with Jesus. That's the real baptism. It should happen at the same time, or maybe a few minutes after, whatever. And so this crossing over, though it was not spoken of as a baptism, when they got on the other side, there was to be a circumcision of the whole nation. Because the former generation had been circumcised, but now they were dead and the younger generation hadn't. God says, there's got to be now a new circumcision. And that's really what baptism is. Circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. But the circumcision not made with hands. But buried with him in baptism unto death. That we might rise to walk with him in newness of life. And so baptism, you see, is that cutting off of the old life. Cut off from Egypt, yes, but there's an extension of it. Not another baptism, but bringing about the reality of that which we had in measure, that which we testified to in faith and obedience. But just as it was with the children of Israel, God had taken them out of Egypt. But in this new circumcision... God would take Egypt out of them because the shame of Egypt, the reproach of Egypt, all that that pertained to the Egyptian life in which they had lived clung to them. Even though they came out of Egypt, somehow it clung to them. You know what I'm talking about. We come to know Christ and we're hoping from now, from now on, it's Nothing but total obedience, total walking with the Lord, total purity, total righteousness. And we always get disappointed. What was wrong? Oh, someone says, you didn't understand what happened when you were baptized. You were buried with Christ. And, oh, no, I didn't understand that. So then, well, we'll baptize you again. And so someone will go through a second baptism and a third baptism. You know, like... Uh, the man and wife say, you know, we didn't really understand when we got married what this was all about. What do you say we go and get married again? Maybe that'll help things along. No, it isn't that. You made the commitment, maybe in your ignorance, but God holds you to it. Maybe in our ignorance, but nevertheless knowing the call of God, we said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you all the way. He holds us to it. He holds us to it. Not with an iron hand, but because of his love and Mercy and grace lifts us up when we fall, causes us to know that he does love us. He understands our weakness. He understands our frailty. He woos us along to bring us to that day and hour when somehow, by the operation of his Spirit within us, that which we bore witness to, which God bore witness to, as we were baptized in water, signifying our identification with him, somehow it becomes more and more and more real. And we discover that the only way we really come to that overcoming life is by coming to such commitment to him that we truly bear about within us the dying of the Lord Jesus, which we can't do in our own fleshly efforts. But he tells us that as we obey him, we'll be able to do it. Because in obedience to the Lord, he leads us through our wilderness. And through circumstances, through situations, he leads us to take out of our lives all that old life of Egypt. 
He leads us to Mara. He leads us to Sinai, where he reveals himself as a God of great holiness, reveals to us the sacrifices, shows us how that in those sacrifices, when we bring that sacrifice unto Christ, he sees his sufferings. And as we begin to identify with it, then that which took place in Jesus when he was nailed to the cross takes place in us. We don't like it. We blame God, murmur for what he's doing. But didn't you marry him? Didn't you say you want to be joined unto him? Then Paul says, if you're joined unto him, you're buried with him in baptism, into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also are to walk in newness of life. And so I, I don't feel that that relationship that we've had with him has really come to fullness yet. I know that. But I don't go and get baptized again thinking that that will help. I want to draw closer to him. I want to ask him, Lord, continue to remind me of of what baptism means. Continue to remind me that it meant the cutting off of the old life. And this took place in a corporate manner up there in Gilgal after they'd gone over and uh, camped on the other side. And you know the story how they took, how the priests uh, stayed there in the bottom of the dry bed of the Jordan while the people of God went over. Paul says, I think God has appointed us unto death. That you Corinthians, you've come to reign as kings, but we are appointed unto death. And our appointment is unto death. You said that when you said, I'll take you in baptism. But you say, I didn't really recognize the implications of it. But God did. And he drew you and you accepted him. And you said in your baptism that I'm being cut off from the old life. And as you walk with him, you ask the Lord to make that commitment that you made to be actual in your life. And God will be faithful to hear, but he'll lead you in ways that you don't like in order that this work of the cross might become actual within us. Knowing that if we're faithful in that, then out of that working of the cross in our lives will come forth his life. So it's not that he leaves us there in the bottom of the Jordan. He leaves the old life there. And so twelve stones were erected in the bottom of the Jordan representing the whole nation. They were left there. And then they took twelve other stones and carried them on the other side. And there they erected them in Gilgal, which means rolling away. Because it was at Gilgal that God says, I'm going to roll away the reproach of Egypt. And I'm... I believe in my heart that there's going to be a corporate people who is a corporate people. God will bring them into a, a rolling away of the old life. Because I don't feel it's all gone myself experientially. I know we thank him for all that has gone, but we still feel, do we not, certain areas of the old life. We get under condemnation over it, which God doesn't want us to do. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul says it has made us free. And so I don't try to kid myself like I used to. Well, Paul says I'm free, so I'm free. And Paul says I'm free, so I'm free when I know I'm not free. But it is true. It, from God's standpoint, we are free. But I've come to recognize when I read scriptures, and I say, I don't measure up to that. I've come to embrace that as a promise rather than to try and figure it out and say, yeah, I'm free. Uh, it's not just the freedom that, you know, that some speak of totally free from the law of sin and death. It can't be that. So we uh, water it down to fit in with our experience. Like in the old holiness movement where God used to use move mightily in cleansing waves of his fire and spirit. It's very real. But in process of time, that experience became less and less obvious in their lives and the lives of others. So they began to major a lot on sins and mistakes, you know. You said, well, no, that was just a mistake because my sins, I was sanctified 20 years ago, so I don't have sin anymore. 
Well, I'd sooner say, Lord, I know I've, I've recognized sin there, and you said I'm free from it. I, all I can say, Lord, I, I'm falling short of what you provided. I'm falling short of your promise. Lead us, Lord, in a way that I might experience the full measure of what you promised. Instead of kidding ourselves that we got it, so we got to explain somehow of why we haven't got it, and still insist we got it. I guess I got you confused there a little. God means what he said. The old life was crucified at the cross. And as God leads us to the place where he enables us to bear that cross as he intended. For there is a cross for us every day. We know that. Jesus bore a cross every day. But because he was faithful every day, the time came when the fulfillment of all the crosses he carried in his life was fulfilled ultimately in the cross in which he died and where we died with him. So that there was an ultimate fulfillment of it in that cross where Paul says, my sins were crucified so that there's no longer any condemnation and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the old law. The laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the old law of sin and death. And when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. When people insist, no, we've got to have the working of the law of sin and death in us as long as we live, just because it's a theological concept, and because they insist that nobody can come to that kind of cleanliness and perfection, they're saying to you and I, that God intends that the law of sin and death will always have more power in this life than the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Which is the most powerful? Which do you think is the most powerful? The law of sin and death that we got from Adam or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Which do you think is the most powerful? So when we look at it that way, if we're saying that the law of sin and death is more powerful, we're saying that the power to sin, the propensity to sin, the ability to sin, the drive towards sin, which we got from Adam, is the greater than the propensity to righteousness, the new life that leads to righteousness, the power of the Spirit that comes from God's Holy Spirit and from Jesus. We're saying that that old law is stronger than this new and higher law. So take it a little further. We're saying that Adam's sin, which was, you know, partaking of the forbidden fruit, that there's more power in our lives because of Adam's sin then there is power in our lives because of Jesus' work on the cross. For if by the disobedience of one we were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one we were made righteous. It's just simply Adam's disobedience that made him a sinner. Because of that, you and I have inherited all that sin the last 6,000 years or whatever. Because of Adam's disobedience. Yeah, but how did I get it? I was just born in Adam. That's all. And though you look at that little babe and see an innocent little child, nevertheless, the seeds of sin are there. Because he got it from Adam. Now, are you going to say that that transmission of the sin of Adam to us has greater power and authority and must always have greater power and authority in our lives than the seed of life that came through Jesus because of his obedience as Adam's disobedience brought this devastation of sin in the world so by the obedience of one shall the many be made righteous read Romans 5 carefully carefully and it staggers you that as it was at Adam, so in Christ, only entirely the opposite. 
As in Adam we die and Christ we live. As we inherit his sin, so we inherit Christ's righteousness. As we're born in Adam, so that sin is transmitted. As we're born in Christ, so that life of Christ is transmitted. And so Gilgal speaks of the cutting off of the old life. Delivered out from Egypt by the crossing of the Red Sea. But in the crossing of the Jordan, the cutting off of the old life of Egypt, the reproach of Egypt. That, that reproach that they carried all through the wilderness is always there. That shame of Egypt. They carried it. Whenever there's any trouble, they blame God and say, let's go back to Egypt. Still that desire to try and find some satisfaction in the old life. They didn't like this manna. It's better back in Egypt. Because God gave them this precious food and because it didn't look good, and it was, it wasn't substantial enough. It wasn't like the, leeks and the onions and the garlic and the fish. It wasn't something substantial. It was, we're told, a light food. They didn't want it. And yet there was everything in that light food that they needed to keep them healthy and strong. Several million of them kept healthy and strong just by eating of that heavenly manna. Pestilences would come in times of disobedience and God would heal them. But he looked after them with that heavenly food. Something that we haven't experienced in the church. But it's there. It's a covenant for God's people. It's, it's, a, it's in the covenant. Healing, health for his people. We have to, we have to walk in obedience for him, unto him until, but God wants a, a ministry that will so minister Christ that they'll come under his lordship. Let us beware anyone who has a word of counsel or a, or as a pastor or teacher of the flock or prophet. Let us always remember that we are there to minister Christ. That we're never to be a mediator. There's one mediator. And over and over again in this generation People have taken the place of a mediator. Whether knowingly or otherwise, people wouldn't do anything that God told them to do unless it went first through this prophet or this apostle or this pastor. If it went through them, he okayed it, fine. What have you got? Two mediators. And so the purpose of ministry as to so reveal Christ so impart Christ, so minister Christ, that they come into a one-to-one -one basis, one-to-one -one relationship with the one mediator. And so that doesn't absolve the ministry of responsibility. It increases the responsibility. You've got to know the voice of God. You've got to come to know what Jesus says. I might have a word from the Lord that would turn him and all that, but let it be a word from the Lord. Then it will be good counsel. Then it will be Urim and Thummim. And God is restoring Urim and Thummim into the midst of his people. I know he's going to do it. In the midst of all the confusing voices in the church, when God's people don't know which, where is that clear word, God is going to bring forth a clear word in Urim and Thummim, which simply means they're Hebrew words that were never translated, simply mean the lights and the perfection. Something that Israel had, something that was in the breastplate of the priesthood. You say, what was it? I don't know. Nobody, nor does anybody else. God didn't tell us what it was. But something there Urim and Thummim that was so effective that standing before God and the priest had a problem or he, he had, had to bring forth a word to the people who were waiting for him to come out of the holiest of all. Uh, there was some need that they had. And yeah, I know they had the scriptures. They had some of them. 
They had the law of the Lord written down, but this was not intended to take the place of the word, nor is your and summons. But you know very well that there are, in every day of our life, there may be things that come up for which we can't get the answer by thumbing through the Bible. We might get some guidance there, but you need some specific answers that the Bible was not intended to give us. Nevertheless, it does tell us, if you'll bind his word about your heart and tie them about the, your neck, that that will be an imparted wisdom to you, so that when you go, it will lead you. When you sleep, it will keep you. And when you awake, it will talk with you. So that's, I think, a picture of this Urim and Thummim. It was in the breastplate that was tied upon the shoulders. Tie them about thy neck. And God is going to impart that hidden wisdom in the hearts of his people who go on with him. So that not necessarily, it's not saying that you will always have the answer. But God will have the answer that he wants you to have. It's not to say that it will always be easy. But somewhere in the body of Christ, somewhere in that fellowship, there will be the answer that that fellowship needs. It might not be in every one. But it'll be there somewhere in this corporate body that there's a time when we have to know the direction. We have to know God's will in this matter. And with that Urim and Thummim abiding in his people, whether it's in a prophet or one of the, someone that is not recognized even as a prophet, but someone says, I'm assured God is saying this and there'll be a confirmation of it. And that Urim and Thummim will be just as clear and just as certain as was the Urim and Thummim that was in the breastplate of the high priest. And that didn't last long in Israel. It wasn't there too long. Time comes, your heart, you don't hear of it anymore. And I'm told that's why the builders of the second temple were so disappointed. Because they did the best they could and got the temple erected and had the priesthood functioning and all that. But where's Urim and Thummim? Not recognizing. It was there in Zechariah. It was there in Haggai. It was there. But God was beginning to put it in the hearts of men. And they had as clear a word from the Lord as Aaron ever got from your own thumb. God was beginning to put it into the hearts of men. Even in the days of the prophets, God was beginning to bring about the new covenant. Where no longer would they have to minister in the old ways, with an old temple, or an old sanctuary. But God was speaking about a new day and a new sanctuary and though he authorized the rebuilding of that one in Zechariah's time and God encouraged them in the building of it he held in his heart he reserved in his heart and only showed them in measure what he wanted them to know and left them discouraged because God said the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the former and they, they couldn't see it didn't look like it they did their best Urim and Thummim wasn't there the glory of God wasn't in the Shekinah. And yet God said it's going to be greater, but they didn't know and the prophets didn't know. And they, they searched, it says, the prophets. They used to search and inquire after God. God, what am I talking about? Doesn't seem to be here. Doesn't seem to be now. What am I talking about? And to them it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things which are now reported unto you by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things even the angels desire to look into. So God was beginning even back there to reveal things. Nevertheless, a lot of it was hidden concerning that great day when Jesus would come. Offer up the perfect sacrifice, ascend to the throne of glory, send forth his spirit to abide in his people to prepare in the earth a temple not made with hands in which would be the full abiding glory, the same glory that led the children of Israel out of Egypt, that same glory would be in that temple. The same Urim and Thummim would be there. The glory of God would be there, far outshining anything that Israel ever had. And so it is a new day for Israel to cross over the Jordan and become God's people cut off from Egypt, cut off from the reproach of Egypt, now ready for war. Don't be too quick to think that, you know, we're soldiers in God's army, we want to be 
But let not him that girdeth on his armor boasteth he that putteth it off. Because there's going to be some very strenuous warfare in order to come into this life. But we've got to know, we've got to be assured that we cannot wrestle against flesh and blood with fleshly weapons. We're wrestling against principalities, and powers, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And God has provided everything we need for that. Everything we need for that. And our weapons are not like the carnal weapons. Spiritual weapons. Helmet of salvation. And I'm assured God's got a helmet, a priestly helmet for his people. With that mind that gives you so much problem, it's going to be overwhelmed with the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to have the mind of Christ. Paul never said, I've got the mind of Christ. He said, we have the mind of Christ. So we look forward to that building of this body. And I don't know we get tired of waiting and so we say, well, the Bible says here, you know, what he wants, so let's do it. And I know that. But Paul says we're builders together with God. He's the architect. He's the builder. Jesus says, I will build my church, like one minister said. People read that scripture where Jesus said, I will build my church so we roll up our sleeves and go to work. Jesus is going to build his church. And you and I are not going to have too much to do with it. Except that somehow he enables us to get under his yoke and and move along with him in his yoke. So we feel we're maybe carrying a big load sometimes. Maybe it's because we're trying to carry his part of the load. For Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so this new people redeemed from Egypt and purified through the wilderness experiences and baptized with this mighty baptism of circumcision, which meant to them a crippling, a total crippling of the armies. But because they were walking in obedience to God, the fear of God came upon the inhabitants of Jericho and they locked the gates because of this feeble, crippled army in their midst. God put the fear of God upon them. And that becomes our victory. Remember that. We can't go against the enemy and try and terrify them. But any kind of antiques that we go through, antics or whatever the word is, can't terrify them with any kind of loud music or rock and roll or drama or presenting puppet shows and that stuff. You're not going to scare the devil one bit. But when they see a people coming along, helmet of salvation, they won't see it, but the host of evil will see it. With the breastplate of righteousness, with the shield of faith, the people girded with truth, with shoes on their feet, shoes not of the gospel but shoes of the preparation of the gospel because these people have been prepared of God when they see that kind of a people it doesn't look too impressive perhaps but they're impregnable they're impregnable but he's given them also a weapon whereby they can be not only impregnable as a fortress but offensive the sword of the spirit which is the word of God that's the only offensive weapon you need but it's got to be that word that cometh out of your mouth this word here but built within us so that when we speak the word that's here comes forth by the Holy Spirit out of the mouth Slay and to kill any destructive thing that comes against us. By the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so, yes, it's nice to come here to learn the Word, to read it, to understand it. But until it becomes not only in our minds, 
and in, in our understanding until it becomes established and built within us you cannot send it forth out of your mouth so God is preparing that kind of a people Isaiah said God has made my mouth as a sharp sword in his hand he hid me hidden in God's hand but when the day God decides to use that sword, you can't do it. Because you're in his hand. You're helpless. God takes it and sends it forth. And it does what God wanted it to do. So let God continue to build his word within you. And to keep you in his hand. Keep you. How long? Just as he sees fit. For only the sword that the Lord sends forth out of your mouth is going to do the work that God wants to do. May God bless this word to each one of you.